Good afternoon. I know it's lunch time, so I'll be really quick. Session I'm going to talk about COVID-19 diabetes session focus, but of course uh, learnings from three years of pandemic and some reflection on how what is the linkage between the two COVID-19 diabetes. So quickly moving to SARS-CoV-2. Here's we have learned enough about SARS-CoV-2. All of us are fully aware that what the virus is, the respiratory virus, developed virus, uh, first coronavirus in, but people often get confused. There have been a four other coronaviruses which cause human illnesses, but mostly mild illnesses. First coronavirus was detected in 1948. Till the year 2003, most of the coronaviruses in human were causing mild illnesses. SARS-CoV, severe acute respiratory syndrome, 2003 was the first coronavirus which caused severe illness. And then MERS, Middle East respiratory syndrome virus circulating. And then coronavirus has become part of our life and SARS-CoV-2 happened. So SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh coronavirus which caused human illness and it has changed our life. In but we also, I'm just putting in the context of learning that we also know that this is a virus which change a lot. Mutations keep happening and till now there have been around 800 different variants of SARS-CoV-2 coronaviruses. But we have heard only five variants, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and omega. So what is the difference? And that's what you need to know so in future we can deal. We can keep hearing, oh, new variant XBB.1. But it's a variant, one of the 800 variants, and every variant does not matter equally. What matters whether it is a variant of concern, which essentially means one of the three things, or maybe more than one, the three things should be there. Either it should result in a more severe disease or it should have a an escape or it should uh, it should be highly transmissible. So transmissibility, clinical outcome or immune escape. If any of those three are present, then only it becomes variant of concern. But if none of this is there in a sub-variant or a new variant, for example, XBB.1.1, one six is a sub variant of uh, or recombinant variant of Omicron. That's why it's not a variant of concern. It has minor difference in transmissibility, but it's very much similar to in clinical feature. So what we need to remember till now we have only five variants of concern. Omicron was the last variant of concern, which was first reported in November 2021, and WHO on March 16, 23 declared that even Omicron is not variant of concern because, because of Omicron, new illnesses are not happening. So the first point, uh, first learning from last three years is that we should not be get alerted by every single variant. There are 800 variants and 100 recombinant variants, like what we hear, XBB.1.16 is currently circulating and causing a surge. The recombinant and a type of Omicron. And if a, a no new variant of concern is there, we should not worry. So that's a one major learning. So what is the current scenario? Current scenario is that this more than three years uh, since pandemic was declared in 2020. Three years, uh, nearly entire humanity has been exposed or infected. In March 2020, everyone was susceptible. We were not clear that what would be the outcome of infection. But now in April 2023, Everyone has been exposed. We have developed immunity. And even if antibody decline, immunity, there is a memory cells which keep providing protection for long. So that's the one key change. We also know that uh, who will be developing a severe outcome. Infection, probability of infection is similar for everyone. But uh, we in a healthcare are more concerned about the severe outcome. And severe outcome is more likely in uh, anyone who is more than 60 years. Of course, unvaccinated, anyone who is unvaccinated would have a severe outcome. But anyone who is more than 60, 18 to 59 year old with comorbidities such as diabetes or hypertension and immunocompromise. So these are the individuals who, who have a higher risk of severe outcome. Having said that, if people are vaccinated, vaccines protect from subsequent infection. That's what is happening. We often keep hearing, okay, this is a reinfection. 
But I think that's a wrong term because when entire population is exposed, anyone who would develop infection is a reinfection in a sense. We would have been worried about reinfection if there was a sterilizing immunity. That means either vaccination would have protected from infection, but vaccines we know do not protect from subsequent infection, but vaccines protect from moderate to severe illness. Even if you are vaccinated, actually it happened in a second wave that people were going to the vaccination centers for vaccination and then they developed infection. And you can be vaccinated, you can recover from illness, but you can get reinfection. So in SARS CoV 2, Neither pass infection nor the subsequent vac nor the vaccination prevent from reinfection or subsequent infection, but both the pass infection and vaccination prevent from moderate to severe illness. India, nearly 97% of adults have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine shot, and 90% plus has received both shot. What has been the impact of this? The impact has been the infection to clinical outcome dissociation. What it essentially it means that people are getting regularly infected. Infection is happening in the community. We see, uh, we keep hearing one ten thousand cases every day come, being reported in India. Actual number of case infection would be far higher. Ten thousand are those who are being tested. But the impact is that so infection is happening, but moderate to severe illness is not happening. There is a data which is analyzed by the government that majority of those who have a, who are hospitalized are either those who were already admitted and tested also had COVID. But not, not many or very few are getting admitted after COVID-19 infection. COVID-19 infection is happening, but moderate to severe illness is not happening. That's a dissociation which we are seeing. And since SARS-CoV-2 is going to be with us for long, so uh, we should be prepared for such kind of infections. There are, in uh, my opinion, uh, there are a wider understanding that there is nothing like COVID-appropriate behavior anymore. When COVID was pandemic, that time you were following such certain behavior. Now there is an approach of protecting the vulnerable for good respiratory etiquette. What you need to do to prevent yourself any respiratory illness, flu, yeah, tuberculosis, respiratory syncytial virus, the same thing you need to do. What you, whatever you want to do to prevent from respiratory illness, do the same for COVID. So nothing specific for COVID is needed. What it means that anyone who has a cough, cold, and fever should wear masks both inside the home or in the public place. Inside the homes to protect others. You do not worry. Even if it's a mild infection, you don't want to pass infection other family members. First thing is that good respiratory etiquette for fem, uh, for individual sick person. Pro wear mask at home, protect family. Wear mask outside to not pass on to others. For uh, 60 plus and uh, 18 to 59 high risk individual, it is advisable that uh, when surge is happening, when cases are rising, they should wear mask when going to the crowded place. For healthy individual. Probably there is no need of doing anything or at least no re recommendation. This is an individual choice. If uh, you are a healthy individual, fully vaccinated, want to wear mask, wear mask. If you do not want to wear mask, all right. So these are the good respiratory etiquette. This is an approach we need to follow. But the point to remember is that SARS-CoV-2 infections keep rising and falling. But there is a one difference. People say it has become like flu. So one of the difference from flu is that though clinically you cannot differentiate symptoms from flu, flu or COVID, but uh, rather there are two differences. One is that uh, one point to remember that if someone has COVID, then that person is unlikely to have a, in other respiratory illness. So co-infections of respiratory viruses do not happen. So there is not many reports that somebody would have a COVID also and in the viruses. Yeah, also flu uh, illness. So only one type of illness happens at a time. Second key difference is that viral flu or a seasonal flu to follow a seasonal pattern. In India flu season is like June, September, the rainy season, and then December to March. But in SARS-CoV-2, there is no such seasonal pattern identified now. Like uh, flu disappears as, as soon as uh, summer start. We had witnessed the second wave of uh, COVID-19 Delta wave in, at the peak of the summer. So, so COVID does not have a seasonal pattern, at least till now, it might have in the future. 
but flu has a senior. He should be prepared for rise and fall in the cases, but more important is to keep tracking on uh, other aspects of uh, clinical outcome. Clarity of coming to the this another learning which is on vaccination. Two shots of COVID-19 vaccines are recommended for everyone. Even in India, like the government guideline never said that all adults should get a COVID third shot of precaution. Precaution shots are absolutely essential and recommended for a high risk vulnerable population, 60 plus, 18 to 9 comorbidity, or anyone immunocompromised. But it's useful that uh, if other healthy adults, as per their individual, they take uh, COVID-19 vaccines. So COVID-19, 18 plus population is recommended COVID-19 vaccine. Then, now people are talking about that, should they get fourth COVID-19 shot or not? First of all, there is a, this has been studied on a vaccine, mRNA-based vaccine, West, where fourth vaccine shot was given. So scientifically, immunologically, that if you give a fresh shot of COVID-19, any vaccine, it will result in higher quantity of people. Wherever antibody would be there, giving additional shot will result in rise in the antibody level. But COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, there is no correlate of protection, which essentially means there is no marker at what should be the level of antibody which will be protective. Current understanding that uh, once you have been either exposed to the natural virus or vaccine, don't have to um, estimate your antibody level, you are protected. If you have not developed antibodies even after natural infection or vaccination, you probably will not develop after subsequent shots. Uh, in mRNA based vaccine, fourth shot give a higher level of antibody, but then those after giving fourth shot, the antibody level declines very quickly, every three to four, every, within three to four months to a pre vaccination level. The current understanding that and this kind of work has, study has not been done for vaccines being used in India. So current understanding is that there is no need of a fourth COVID-19 shot for any population, no matter when you received the third. India started on 10th of January 2022, the COVID-19 vaccination, but there is a, even if it's more than one year, but we know that Omicron or subvariants were circulating. We regularly have been exposed to the virus. Current understanding is that we don't need a fourth shot. That does not mean we may not need ever. This would be an ongoing learning. There might be uh, some new pathogens, but if disease can mild, may not require vaccine. The reason is simple. It's, uh, the vaccines do not provide, prevent from subsequent infections. So take uh, a fresh shot, it will not protect from it. And moderate to severe illness continue to be remain low, whether you receive vaccine or not. But in India, by June 2021, when zero surveys were done, 90% of India's population had already developed antibody, which means exposed. And we have developed, uh, had vaccinated our population. India had developed hybrid immunity. And, uh, it, it matters a lot whether you developed a vaccine after natural infection or vaccine first and natural infection later. India's scenario seems till now very fairly assuring and unlikely to change, so you don't need a fourth shot of vaccine. I just because this is the theme of uh, topic is COVID-19 and uh, diabetes, so also I want to use some time to reflect about how, why it makes a, uh, why in COVID-19 or diabetic individual, why COVID-19 becomes a serious illness. So uh, we know that this is diabetes is a risk factor for severity of illness, but diabetes, but it's also results in poor prognosis of infection. So if you are diabetic, you are more likely to get infection, but results in poor infection. And there are multifactorial reasons, which are linked to, of course, in any illness, age, sex, comorbidity, other conditions. So what happens, SARS-CoV-2 transmission, it actually downregulates the ACE2 receptors in the pancreas and other organs, which results in cytokine storm. And in that scenario, because we know in SARS-CoV-2, any other illness, so any, any organ can be affected. So pancreatic survival is reduced or affected. That results in the reduced insulin secretion, and which essentially hyperglycemia, which essentially means uh, less immune protection and severe outcomes. So, this is one of the hypotheses. Right? Some of the points, so worsening of hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, 
increased inflammatory response, stimulation, cytokine storm, uh, higher cytokine release, pancreatic damage, pancreatic fibrosis. These are the factors which have been studied and identified for a poor outcome. And all of this results in, because high level of sugar itself is in the weakened defense system in the patient, with, or especially those who are uncontrolled diabetics. And diabetes is a pro-inflammatory syndrome, as all of you know. So there are multiple immune or cytological mechanisms which affect uh, the poor outcome, worse outcome, and makes people more prone to the uh, moderate to severe illness. Uh, I've already explained this. Thing. So this association is linked to the hyperglycemia and both acute and chronic effect. Talked about cytokine. So this is a summary slide that why poor outcome of all the things. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 actually PC2 receptor down regulation, it can cause beta cell damage, cytokine storm, which can cause admission hyperglycemia, worsening of metabolic conditions. You, in fact, uh, there are people, uh, there are many reports uh, being documented that people who were not uh, diabetic earlier, but after SARS CoV 2 infection, they, become di they were diagnosed as diabetic. Some of them might have been di diabetic earlier, but definitely it's widely known that it affects the beta cells and and fibrosis, and that's why the diabetes is higher. And then other factors which are listed results in a poor outcome. Um, there are studies which have looked at the clinical characteristic and outcome of patients with severe COVID-19 and diabetes. Some of the key differences that, uh, like you see on the last column, value less than 0 0.05. So what you see that uh, diabetic uh, are usually older people who have a poor outcome. Class 2 said mortality definitely is higher in diabetic and really high. And uh, those required mechanical ventilation was also high in diabetic in comparison of diabetic. And on diabetes early 2020. But on the survival rate, there are some data available that uh, survival rate in diabetic is a Kaplan Meier survival curve for patients with severe COVID 19 and diabetic. Non-diabetic is far higher in comparison of diabetes. So diabetes is definitely a well-known, documented effect of this thing, COVID-19. Plasma glucose labels and diabetics are independent predictor of mortality. So this uh, graph, graph shows that the people who had a higher plasma glucose label, higher mortality, a lower survival in comparison of well-regulated. So it's a time that the people should be taking care of uh, their diabetes, blood sugar. Management remains largely unchanged. These guidelines keep evolving. But what is, uh, of course, uh, broad principles that uh, no, no infection but individual at high risk, latest guidelines are followed. Mild COVID-19, metformin, SGLT2, and GLP-1 are the primary recommended first-line drugs, and other drugs are second-line drugs. In hospital settings, of course, insulin is funded. I want to give your attention to the slide that majority of drugs like keep working, but there are some other. This is extension of that slide, and I will not go into this. So let me reflect about the, the last part. So now it's conclusive that uh, people with diabetes, any other comorbidity, are higher risk of severe disease, moderate to severe disease, hospitalization, and mortality outcome. Of course, it is changing, mortality is reducing, but even now, people who are getting admitted to the hospital are those who are with COVID. The diabetes uh, comorbidity, COVID-19 is still a risk, and such individuals who are di known diabetic uh, should wear mask and follow a more stringent respiratory etiquette when there is a surge in the illnesses or any. Of course, uh, the reminder, COVID-19 pandemic is a reminder for everyone to stay healthy, but more so for diabetic patients. This attention or this approach, like we should not, like at the same time, scare. I personally, COVID is a major challenge. It has become an endemic in the country, and this situation will last for long. But it's a time that people follow good respiratory etiquette to prevent from other illnesses, which will COVID-19 also. One of the key challenges in undocumented area in India is a Long COVID, post COVID, some of the cause it affect any organ. There are 200 plus symptoms or clinical conditions documented as long and post COVID. India need to study and diabetic also this studied. 
RSSI or any group which is working on public health advocacy and thank you very much